uh, the guy said, hey, Mike, you got, you know, you got six months to figure out what you want to do, you know, in terms of what therapy you want to use. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Be Super, where we talk to high achieving leaders so we might learn about ourselves. Today, we're talking to film and television actor, writer, and director Michael Dorn. Having been in near 300 television episodes and four films of Star Trek as the iconic character Worf, starting with The Next Generation, The Deep Space Nine, The First Contact, and Nemesis, just to name a few. He's also a prolific voice actor from huge franchises such as Arrow, Gargoyles, and I Am Weasel. You might have caught him also in the Amazon series and comic Invincible as Battle Beast, recently out. He's been in legendary video games such as Mass Effect, Fallout, World of Warcraft, and Lego DC supervillains. Finally, he's brought to life characters from indie films, notably from Santa Claus trilogy Sandman. I've had the honor of working with him on Agent Revelation as the role of Alistair, and in doing so, really got to learn from him and his mindset and philosophy around not only about creating film and television, but life. And I wanted to share that with you. So please welcome my friend, Michael Dorn. How you doing? As usual, we're going to jump right into it. Tell me about starting out. Everything was almost serendipitous from, from the very beginning. I, I was in music for a long time, so I was sort of in the, in the entertainment business. And then I, had, once again, serendipitous, I, I went to college to study psychology. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And halfway through psychology, I went, oh my God, you know, I'm, I'm like drooling on myself. I, I'm so like not into it. And then I went into radio and TV uh, producing. And I discovered that I had, uh, and the teachers told me this, and all the, st the students and everybody was, uh, you have a really good eye for, for editing and for, you know, what looks good and, you know, directing, basically. And so I said, well, this, is, this was very exciting. And so I decided to, to uh, go to college for that. And um, I went up to San Francisco, got accepted into San Francisco State. And of course, in those days, you know, you got to get a job to pay for tuition and whatever the case, you know, it's a state school. So it wasn't super expensive, but I got a job and I didn't go back to school. The job was incredible in terms of life experiences. How do you have an apartment? How do you do budgets? How do you write checks? How do you pay bills? I mean, just relationships and work. How do you do this work thing and mm -hmm. be successful successful at it? Mm -hmm. And I didn't know anything. Nobody teaches you that. They don't have a, a class in any college about life. It's always Spanish or take French or what's your major, home economics. And so uh, I was learning a lot. And then when I moved back to Los Angeles, I was working, doing music and playing in bands. And here was here's where the serendipitous part began, which is a good friend of mine that I went to high school with, his dad was assistant director on the Mary Tyler Moore show. They saw me and I was working in a department store at Christmas and they said, hey, Michael, you know, you've got to do this. And I said, okay. And they basically, to make a long story short, they got me into that part of the business where I could learn and, and um, shadow people on this show, on the Mary Tyler Moore show, to learn how to direct. And once again, serendipitous, I did a little part. The, I was standing in for this actor and he couldn't make it one day for this particular scene. And so they say, hey, Michael, we want you to read his lines and interact. And so I did. And for two weeks after that, uh, they were talking about, Michael, you got to do this acting. You got to do the acting. You were wonderful. You know, you got this quality. And I'm like, yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. <laughs> and um, so I, I thought it started thinking seriously about it. And a guy that was working on the show, I'll never forget his name, John Lawler, uh, was he was actually doing really, really well in the late 70s. I mean, he was he was doing a lot of stuff. And he says, Well, Michael, I'm leaving my commercial agency. Why don't you, why don't I call them and you can go down there and have a meeting? So he called them and uh, in those days, that was a way to get into the business or to, to 
start working as an actor. Right. And I went in and had a meeting with, <laughs> with, the, uh, with the head of the company, Sonia Brandon. And I thought it went terrible. I mean, it was like, I kind of was going, Geez, why are you having me in here? That was just horrible. And I walk out and she says, well, go out and, and fill out this, this form. As I'm filling out the, the form, this guy walks by that works there. He goes, oh, congratulations. And I went, on what? He says, well, you're going to be working with us. You're filling out the, uh, I go, so that was, I started doing commercials. That was the sort of the start. Mm -hmm. And I had a friend that I knew very well and her um, boss was a big producer at that point. And they were doing the series web. And her boss said, hey, Michael, we have a part that we'd like you to play. And I go, okay. And as I'm playing the part, I mean, I was shooting that day I think it was just one day, the uh, agent, who was my first agent, happened mm. to be on the set. And he said, he saw me, he saw what I was doing, and he goes, y y y I, wanna, I wanna represent you. I was, I was about to say you were, but you, you are a good looking guy too. Thank you. Pretty stand out. I know people know you from the role of Worf in uh, Star Trek, but you know I've seen pictures of you uh, in, like in chips and everything. But so you, you yeah, definitely yeah. stood out and you're very tall and- yeah, it was, it was, it was all of that. It was all mm -hmm. of that. And there was, uh, I, I felt I had a quality. I knew that I wanted to be, I thought I was a natural actor and, uh, there was a little ego. I didn't want to do anything to mess with my naturalness, but what happened is that I knew that, uh, at some point you're going to have to branch out from the, the one thing that they see you as, which is a cop or a doctor or a lawyer, you know, very sort of benign characters not really stretching either direction. And so I knew that I had to uh, do something about that. You had to, you, you got to have a range or else you're only going to play one thing. Mm. And so that's what, that's why. And from there, I did a, a quite a few commercials and um, got a, an audition for chips. It didn't hurt that I looked like a cop, you know, <laughs> didn't, you know, that didn't, that didn't, you know, stand in my way. But then I got the audition for Chips. And uh, once again, serendipitous, I read for the part and they gave it to somebody else. And they said, Michael, we really liked your reading. We really want you, but we're gonna go with this guy. And I go, okay, fine, no problem. And the guy said he could ride a motorcycle and he jumped on the motorcycle and ran into a wall. I mean, just crashed it. And uh, so that's when they called me back. <laughs> said, uh, we want you to read again. You know, and so, and then I got hired and that was three years and I was still doing commercials at the time. And I did other parts and, you know, guest stars and other shows too. Mm. So it was, it was pretty heady time. Well, that's interesting. I mean, the fact that you were, you know, sort of physically capable as well, actually really helped you out too, because running a motorcycle is not easy either. I mean, you have to get a license and all no. that stuff too. I mean, I, I had a motorcycle up in San Francisco, a little, Kawasaki 250 dirt bike that I rode around San Francisco. And then when I moved back to, to LA, I was working at a stereo shop down in Orange County. And the guy, the, the assistant, assistant manager, rode a, the first Kawasaki Z1900s that, that came into the country. Wow. And those things, it, it was like, it was like you couldn't believe the speed of those of those bikes and and he says mike i have a girlfriend and you know she doesn't want to ride on my, on my motorcycle when she comes down to visit me so why don't we switch and so every other weekend i would be on the motorcycle driving from pasadena down to orange county it was it was such a great great bike we haven't even mentioned you being a pilot and you you've flown so that, that kind of, that does speak to you sort of liking speed like it was this like even oh, as a kid do you always liked uh sports or activities that were like dangerous <laughs> let's say no no not dangerous i mean sports was always a part of our lives we never thought about the danger of it i mean mm -hmm. very rarely did people get really hurt in sports what, in those days 
What did you play? What, what sports were you like into? Uh, a- baseball, baseball, most of my life, and then football. Um, two years in um, high school and one year in college. What what uh, positions were you in uh, baseball? Oh, uh, first position? base, I'm lefty. Oh, you're really uh, so, okay. You're lefty. Okay. But, yeah, lefty. So I played first base and the outfield. And I played all the outfield. Oh, you really got to run if you're in the outfield. That's very different from first base, like two different positions. Very different, yeah. And I, and I, and I love the outfield too. I really did. It was, it was, I had a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun. And then football, so, uh, or what, what did you, I know you like watching football as well. So what, what position did you play? I played uh, split in, in, in high school. And then when I went out for the team in college, I, I was a uh, tight end. And okay. I practiced and I did, I went there and, and halfway through the season, I not through the season, but through the preseason where you're doing all the practice before the game, I just lost interest. I just lost interest. I, you know, it, it wasn't fun. Mm-hmm. So I just, I just kind of quit. We certainly had this, I guess you certainly had the size or like the potential if you wanted to yeah. even go that yeah. route yeah. to try to be pro or something. Yeah. But. I, I was, I was, I was right in the middle, you know, I wasn't terrible, but I wasn't a star. I had a, <laughs> I had two, I had three friends that I grew up with and I was through all elementary school and they went to the pros, but the three of them were stars. I mean, mm. they were the best athletes in California, that kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I wasn't, that. I mean, I think I would have grown into it, mm-hmm. but just didn't have that opportunity. Go ahead. I was just curious. No, did you kind of know, did you kind of know, like I, you know, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm very good, but maybe at that level, you know, maybe it, even if I go down that path, it'll be a lot of hard work because I won't be, a, you know, uh, maybe you won't be able to achieve that. You know, kind of like know yourself in a way, or maybe you weren't thinking about it. And it wasn't like a, do you know what I mean? No, I actually, actually I had a, I had a pretty good size ego <laughs> and, um, <laughs> And it wasn't about the, the physicality. It was about the idea that, that in college, mm-hmm. um, football became a business. Ah, and I see. Okay. It, it, was, it wasn't about um, ability. Because there was a guy that, who was older. So he was, you know, like a year older who was on the team. Right. And everybody knew that I was better than he was at that position but they're going to let him play. And you kind of go, okay, you know, and, and to me, that was like ridiculous. And so I said, well, I'm not going to knock myself out, you know, right. to back him up for a year. And, um, uh, and, it, and it was a business. His, his parents were uh, big supporters of, um, of the college. They donated a lot of money. It got into the business part of it. And I just didn't enjoy that part. So, mm. so that's what. Happened. Yeah. Oh, no. I mean, I think that's interesting because obviously I mean, you're in the, the film and entertainment business, which is so difficult, has many gatekeepers. Yeah. I'd love to hear about uh, what I was going to ask you about was um, studying with your teacher. Mm-hmm. Um, Charles Conrad, because he's mentioned in your Wikipedia page uh, and it had. Yeah. I, yeah, I wanted to know. Um, there's Charles Conrad. His name is Charles Conrad, and he. St- I looked looked like he did Sanford Miser. Is that what you learned? Did you learn San- San- start with yeah. that, and then kind of, and how like how often did you go to class? Like, because it, um, you know, before you got that role, was it part time or? Well, the Wikipedia, you got to you got to take all that stuff with a grain of salt. The the Charles Conrad thing was was very brief. Okay, it was extremely, okay. Brief. and so I wouldn't say that that was. That was my my um, my education. Uh, wow. What happened was that, um, and and you mentioned that in one of the questions was you know between chips and and Star Trek, there's that's five years, yeah. And so, yeah. and and I was I was still doing a lot of commercials. I was doing sitcoms. I was doing dramatic shows. It wasn't you know it wasn't like uh, I was living on the street or something like that. I was still working fairly well but Mm -hmm. at one point i was getting auditions and i wasn't booking and they uh it's really it was a great time in those days because the the agents had relationships with the casting directors emails or that type. i mean they were they were phone calls 
and you had relationships with everybody. And they said, well, Michael is, we like him, but when he comes in for cold readings, uh, he's boring. And you go, well, I don't want to be boring. And so um, uh, I looked around for uh, a bunch of acting classes, but a little, let me digress a little bit. At yeah. that point, my agents were like going, you know, Michael, this isn't working really well. You know, I think you should think about getting out and doing something else, you know? Whoa, and, really? They said that to you? Uh, yeah. This is after you did yeah. Chips, though. I mean, you had 31 yeah. episodes well, on Chips. Yeah. And, you know, I, another stuff, too. I wasn't, you know, not working. And so I said, oh. And they said, we, we just can't represent you anymore. And I said, well, look, represent me until, you know, I find another agent. Could you do that? And so I was actively looking for another agent. They said, sure. They were good friends. So they were fine with that. Yeah. yeah. But in the meantime, I had gone to um, this class that really was the breakout class for me, which was Brian Reese ah. acting class in Los Angeles. Now that was the class. I had, I had audited a bunch of classes and they all were sort of okay. Mm -hmm. You go in and you read and, you know, the guy would sit back and go, oh, that was terrible or that was great. Well, be more this, you know, I mean, it was, and, and but when I got to Brian's class, I went in there and even I was like blown away by the level of competency of these actors. I mean, you go out they give you two pages or three pages of dialogue. You go out, you learn it for two hours, you can come back in and they would put on these scenes and it would just blow me away. And not only just doing it the way that they want, that you're supposed to, but a lot of them had really interesting takes on the material. And I was just stunned. And so I go, okay, I wanna be one of those guys, <laughs> you know? And so I started taking the class and it just all of a sudden, literally overnight, uh, I started booking jobs like, like insane. Like I would, I would read for two or three jobs and I'd like, I'd read for three jobs, I'd get two of them, you know? I read for two jobs, I'll get one of them, you know? So I was working a lot. Wow. Yeah. And, pretty and Brian Reese was the guy that uh, he was the guy that that um, that really opened me up, really opened me up. Yeah, how how, how long did you go, how, how long did you go with him? How long was what, were you working with him before Next oh, Gen? God, uh, two years, year and a half, something like that. About two okay. years. Wow. And, yeah. Um, so you put really put the time. Funny. That's, I mean, oh, that's yeah. not, oh, yeah. it's it was not just like, oh, I took a couple classes. That's no, no, it was, it was once a week. And, mm -hmm. you know, you d I didn't have much money in those days, but I, I definitely got the money to pay for that. Right. Yeah. And, you, uh, so you invested in yourself. I mean, is that totally. a lot of people have a hard and, time and when, doing that? And when my, uh, when my agents said, you know, Michael, uh, we think you ought to get out. And I thought for, a couple of seconds, maybe a minute. Right. I kind of went, wow, you know, that's, but then I, I, like you said, I went, wait a minute. I was on a, a top 20 series and I've been working like, you know, I've done all these commercials and I'm, of course not, you know? Yeah. <laughs> the one thing that, that I did learn is that people in all businesses, and that doesn't matter about acting or anything. There are always people who will tell you what you can and can't do. Always. Mm. And if you look around, you'll see that they're wrong about that. <laughs> you know, you'll see people doing exactly what they said that you can't do. And there's mm -hmm. no difference between them and you. There's absolutely mm. no difference. And so I just started, I mean, from that moment, I went, okay, no, no, I, I don't. I don't believe that. And so uh, 
And interestingly enough, maybe six months after I started working even more, I called them and I said, oh, by the way, guys, I found another agent that wants to work with me. And they were like, well, what are you talking about? We, we're gonna work with you. And I go, no, no, you dropped me. No, 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 that was then, but we wanna. <laughs> so, and, and it's, it's one of those things where you just, if somebody starts telling you what you can and can't do, then don't listen to them. Mm. That just do not listen to them because all you have to do is look around and you will see examples all over the place of people that are doing exactly what they said that you can't do. And um, there's just, I mean, when I first got in the business, the guy said, hey, Michael, you know, it's going to take you 10 years to get anything in this business. I mean, 10 or 15. And I go, really? Oh, yeah. And it took me a year and a half. So yeah, that, there goes his, you know, his advice. Though, you, I mean, you did put in the time. I mean, you started on chip. So that must have been at least seven years um, between then yeah. getting next gen and it's, it's you know people probably think that you just kind of walked in <laughs> to yeah. to that audition and just got it but you really had put in the the sweat and the hard work and the sort of soul searching but were well were, were you you mentioned you had a uh, a big ego but were you what what was the time where did you find that confidence was it from your parents or your family do you think you were born with being a very confident child or? I think I was, it's interesting about parents. I mean, I definitely got it from my parents, but they never taught you ego. They didn't, that wasn't part of their teaching. But in them, when they were growing up, when they were kids, they had, you know, a very strong sense of self uh, because they grew up at a time where you have to be self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it, it's the old adage where they were truly, and this is no joke, where they would get up, they were raised on a farm, my mother was, and they would get up at 5.30 to do all the chores of the farm, then go to school, then come home, have dinner, do the ch chores at night, and then go to bed. Mm -hmm. So when people say, God, I had to take my, my daughter to school today and I'm really tired, I just roll my eyes. I go, you, you don't know what tired is. Mm. So I got that. I got that sort of, you know, that Midwestern sort of work ethic. Um, but it's come, it, the ego comes from my parents, you know, it, and I don't, I never looked at it as ego. I just said, God, I'm an artist and I have this and I think I can, you know, I think this is going to help me and, the, and it'll be good. And, but I never was like, I'm better than anybody else. Mm, yeah. I never, I never, I never said that. I always was very sort of like, that's, this, it's just me. I just mm -hmm. know that I have the ability to do this. Uh, but I never was egotistical about it. Like, you know, well, I'm, I'm really the best there is, you know? So mm. yeah. And I got that from, I got that from my parents too. They're, they're incredibly humble. Um, but you, you don't screw with them, you know? It's like, <laughs> they'll let you, you know, okay, you know, but they don't, you know, you don't screw with them, so. There's, was it, there was no coddling going on when you were growing up. Do, do you have any brothers and sisters or were you the only child or? I have an older brother. Okay. And I have a cousin who's my, my mother's sister's son who is like my brother, you know? Uh, so I was the, I was the baby of the family. And so the baby didn't get coddled. The baby got ignored most of the time. Right. Um, right. But, uh, but there was something in me that I always felt that, you know, that even though I was ignored and they never listened to me, I always felt, yeah, I'm smarter than they are. They'll, they'll understand when I'm, when I'm 10, they'll, they'll know. <laughs> So uh, some sort of inner, yeah, it's, you had an inner fire and drive something in you that was. Yeah, you do, um, you do, you do. And, and, I, and, I, and a lot of times people see that and I don't see it, you know. Um, 
people see it in me and they, you know, a lot of people are very sort of, you know, they're drawn to it and some people are, are afraid of it, you know? Hmm. And so, um, and I don't do anything to, I mean, I've had people come up to me and go, oh, you think you're so good, don't you? And I went, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> I have no idea where you got that from. If you have that, mm -hmm. you know, then recognize it and understand that it's a gift. And, you know, what do you do when you, when you have a gift? You share it. You know, you share it with, you know, people. And, and that is, that's very important. That's very important. Yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to ask you, um, I'm sure people know much about um, Star Trek, but I know that the, the makeup chair was a big issue for you. I mean, you did that for many years. Um, so I wanted, I wanted to talk about that in terms of the resilience. I know um, after a couple of years, you were like fed up, um, can't do this. What, why did you, what, what made you continue on? through that like how did you get through that yeah and, and it wasn't it was once again it wasn't about ego it, it was really about health because I had went through a, a bout of topical eczema when I was at in chips and it really was pretty brutal I mean it really um, caused a lot of problems because I, there were days I couldn't work because it was just so bad yeah, that I mean, it causes a lot of eczema, causes scarring and everything. It, it doesn't, it doesn't show. Scarring. Um, um, also, it, it, you know, if it's bad enough, it, it, it starts to affect um, uh, your insides, you know, mm. your, your, your metabolism and your, you know, I, it was, it was really bad. So uh, what happened is that the, the second season, uh, it started to get really bad. Mm -hmm. And nobody uh, came to my aid. Nobody, the makeup people, the producers, nobody said, oh my God, Michael, we have to do something about this. And at one point they were putting the makeup on, I think the second season, my friend Marina said, Michael, look at your face. Look, look at what they're doing to you. And I said, I know. And I was agreeing with her and they, they were looking at me going, oh, don't worry about it, it's no big deal. And so I said, that's it. And I stopped the makeup. I just went, okay, that's it. I had half, half the head on and, and just, and I went up to the producers and I, <laughs> Love I didn't barge in the door, but I knocked on the door and I said, I gotta see you. And they said, what's going on? I said, I can't do this anymore. I said, I love the character. I love the show. I, I love working. Uh, I love the people I work with, mm -hmm. but I need to have a career when this is over. And I don't want my face to be scarred, you know, because of that. And that, that was the first time they looked at me and they went, oh, okay. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, um, and then they said, um, they said, well, to the makeup guy that, the makeup coordinator they said well can you do something and he says oh yeah we can do this and we can do this and we can do this and i had asked him about this six months before and they said no there's nothing we can do oh, so man. you really have to you really got to stand up for yourself for me it's always been one way and i've, I've talked about this recently is that i'll just kind of take it and then just one day i'll just go okay that's it i'm done and that's the way that i kind of deal with it and luckily, they, they did change a lot. They did change a lot. And I had a great dermatologist, too. So that helped. Mm. Still, still, I'm sure, like, it got better. But I'm sure, so, like, with near 300 episodes, that's, that's... And then the number of shooting days on top of that per episode, that's a lot of days well, in the they, makeup chair, a lot of hours. The, the good part is that my skin is resilient. And... If you give it, and this is, this is true of your body in general, is that if you give your body a chance to heal, it will do miraculous things, but you have to give it a chance. And once I, once I gave my face a chance with a, with a different type of system and, and putting things differently in whatever the case, you know, it, it turned out very well. You know, the skin just went, okay, now I have 
some breathing room and we can we can fix this. What I did though was which was very interesting is that in order to cope with the makeup process, I would read the LA Times from the first page to the last page and do the crossword puzzle. And for some reason, by the time I finished the crossword puzzle, they were done. <laughs> and wow. I wasn't I wasn't paying attention to yeah. what they were doing at all. I was just or reading my lines or you know, learning my lines and doing that. And that was mm. it, you know, and then, then they go, okay, we're done. And I go, okay. And I get up and I, so wow. that was a way to cope with it is just, I, I just didn't know what they were doing. You were focused. I mean, um, I'm actually even curious, Let, let's go on that tangent, just see where it goes with um, sure. uh, maybe meditation or sort of, you know, mind focus. Is that something that you think about in, in daily life? Do you meditate at all or do any kind of that sort of, practice or to oh yeah clear your mind I've become, I've become a pseudo buddhist at this point um I've, I've kind of adopted a lot of practices meditation stretching sitting quietly mm -hmm. for 20 minutes is is always good uh understanding the mind body connection which is amazing and understanding uh, a lot of other stuff about judgments, you know, about uh, learning how to radiate who you are, you know, just putting it out there and not being concerned, you know, uh, with how people perceive you mm. uh, because, you know, the universe loves you, you know, it really does. And, and your body loves you. And, and if you take care of it, it takes care of you. you know? Right. And yeah. Um, and I, I've, I've really, I mean, everything has kind of turned around. It's funny how it turned around was that I was, I was always looking for something. And then when I got my prostate cancer 12 years ago, 13 years ago, uh, I went to a guy who is, who does Jinzen Jitsu and a martial arts guy. And he's really, and he started, he helped me get through the process of the whole prostate cancer thing. And, wow, I didn't uh, know you went through that. That must have been so challenging. Did you have to go through like chemo or um, surgery? No, or no they, they caught it early. They caught uh -huh. it very early. Uh -huh. And prostate cancer is the slowest growing cancer. I mean, it's like a glacier. And so if you catch it early enough, uh, the guy said, hey, Mike, you got, you know, you got six months to figure out what you want to do, you know, in terms of what therapy you want to use. What I discovered was that uh, what we put in our bodies is hugely um, uh, impactful on these diseases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, you know, uh, red meat causes cancer, prostate cancer. Yeah, I didn't know. I didn't know you had pros prostate cancer. Well, so, but and um, I know you're. It's ve you know you're vegan, so that's when you became vegan. Yeah, yeah. I was already headed towards uh, a vegetarian and eating healthy anyway, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but that's when I just went. Okay, this is it's time. And um, I mean, like the big thing, sugar, is like, you know, whenever somebody who has cancer says, "Michael, what did you do?" and I said, "Well, you got to give up sugar," and to them. That's like saying, you know, you got to stop breathing, you know, because it's just so ingrained in them. But all that stuff is just, and then, you know, we, we, I took very um, organic and natural supplements to, to help. To be honest, it was, it was almost, there was a moment when I wasn't going to do uh, the therapy, which is breaking therapy, which is they inject tiny little seeds into your prostate. Oh. And uh, it, it radiates from the inside, basically. And it's an outpatient procedure. You go in and you're out of there in an hour and a half. So it's not a, you know, it's not anything major. And uh, I wasn't going to do it because all of my, the PSA and, and all of these things started going down when I became a vegan. I mean, wow. the PSA count went down, you know, everything. You know, and I was still working out and healthy, and I lost like thirty-five pounds within within a couple of months. That's when I started really 
focusing on that. And I had always looked for, not for a religion, mm-hmm. but for something that kind of spoke to me about how I feel and how, you know, what works and what I gravitate, gravitate towards. And that was, that was a big thing. Mm. Yeah. A, lo- a lot of self-reflection and a lot of self like, but you know, the big thing also is, is for me was, was judgments. You know, you judge and we judge so many times during the day. I mean, oh mm-hmm. God, what an asshole. Well, I don't know. Why do you do that to me? I don't understand that. What's going on over there? Oh, look at that. You, you just, you judge a situation where if a guy cuts you off on, in the street, you know, you're driving. In LA, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's how- <laughs> you just, and, and you got to think to yourself, he says, my, my guy that I go to, he says, you have to thank them. You have to thank him because he, that second that he cuts you off means that you're a second behind a potential dangerous situation and he has saved your life, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because, you know, a second, things change in a second, mm. you know? Mm-hmm. And so you go, thank you, you know, and, and then you got to go, do you think he, he said, you know what, Michael's going to be on the freeway at 2.30 in the afternoon. So I'm going to get on the freeway and make sure that I cut him off. Or, hey, there's Michael Dorn. I'm going to cut him off. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, but that's what he teaches you. And, and it really opened up a lot for me. It really wow. kind of calmed me down. And when you stop judging other people, you're, you're, better, you're better able to judge yourself. Mm. And if you're into self-realization and, and self-reflection, then all of a sudden you realize, oh my God, I can change that. Oh, wow, I can change that. Mm. Oh, that's about me. It's not about them. Oh, somebody pushed my button. I have a button. Where does that button come from? They're not going... I'm gonna push Michael's button right now, you know, because <laughs> to other people, you're, you know, you're a, you're a blip, you know. Yeah. So anyway, that's my, that's my spiritual talk for today. I want to ask you that that would lead me to another question. I want to ask you about, um, and I was, I was curious because when you were in Star Trek: Next Generation and, and Deep Space Nine, um, there weren't that many. Um, black actors uh, working. So I was, I just want to hear what you thought about, you know, what was going through your mind. Obviously you're super busy, um, you know, doing your role, but was that, was that anything that ever crossed your mind at all that, Hey, like I'm one of the few, you know, and what I do sort of represents, you know, black people, or is that. I never, I, I never thought of that. I really didn't. It was, I was happy to be working. I was, I was a fortunate actor, black, green, yellow, it doesn't matter. I was a fortunate actor to be, to be working on a show, you know, to be on a series, Mm. you know, it's like, you know, 10% of actors are, are, on to make a living and a 10% of that 10% make a good living, you know? So you're at the zero, zero, one percent of actors that, uh, that are doing really well. And uh, that's all I, that's all I knew. Because, you know, I, I, had, I had been through the sixties and the seventies with the whole, you know, black experience. Mm-hmm. And most people who aren't, who didn't go through that just don't understand that, you know, this is something that you know, I've been told for years and years, oh, you know, Michael, you know, you're, you're um, uh, representing, you know, and, and you're, a, you know, you're, a, a, you know, a, um, a role model, you know, and you have to do this and you have to do that. And you find out that those people that say that stuff to you are saying it to you for, for selfish reasons, not, not selfish, malicious, but that's the way they feel. Mm-hmm. and they want you to feel like they feel and i've never i've i felt that way in the 60s and 70s 
then I realized um, how unproductive that is. You know, I, I've always felt and my upbringing is that, you know, don't, don't think about that. Just do the best you can and let the universe make its, make its uh, decisions about what you've done. Hmm. You know? And that's all, I, that's all I really thought about. Yeah, well, but, and I think you obviously are a role model just through, through your philosophy and the way you live your life. Uh, I guess indirectly, but just weren't weren't purposely trying to trying to do that, which is interesting. Well, I wanted to ask you because I remember we were on set um, and we we briefly talked about um, how when when Star Trek kind of finished, it was like starting over, and I was curious uh, why that was so, or what was that like? Obviously, the industry is a tough industry to begin with, but well, you know, when I got the job, I knew it was going to be one or the other. Either I'm going to be um, a new face because everybody hasn't seen my face in 11 years. Um, and um, I'll have to start all over or I will carry the, uh, the, the sort of notoriety of Star Trek into another career, mm -hmm. leads into another career. And I think it, it was a little bit of both actually, right down the middle. Um, people kind of went, oh, Michael, you know, oh, you you look like that, you know, and because they don't really, they don't really see it. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, uh, because of the notoriety of Star Trek, and when we left, Star Trek was, you know, the next generation was, was doing really, really well. Oh yeah, revitalized. And so, yeah, we got so many offers. I got so many offers to do so many movies uh, after that. So probably. 10 years of after like 1999. So 2009, about 2012 or 2013. Uh, so there's a little about 13 or 14 years of, I got, you know, three or four movies a year, just people saying, we'd love for you to be part of this. We'd like for you to do this. We want you to do this and, and really good roles and, and a lot of fun and, and um, you know, stretched it you know, bad guys, good guys, you know, crazy people. So, uh, mm. so it was a little bit of both. I never got the notoriety, notoriety like a George Clooney where he left and he becomes huge, you know, and that type of thing. But I did have a, a very nice career. So I was oh, yeah. about that. Totally. You've been in like everything you touch is, has turned to gold. Yeah, um, hopefully it'll keep going too. Yeah, I know. Right. Fingers crossed here. Um, well, I think this would be a good time then to talk about, yes, and you have an illustrious career in, you know, video games and, and animation, but I know that, uh, you started out, um, learning about directing and you've directed a bunch of episodes along the way too, as well. So tell me about this Western, um, that, that, uh, you plan to self-direct that you wrote and you plan to self-direct. I'd love to hear about that. <laughs> when you say self-direct, it's, it's like self-examination, you know, I'm like, <laughs> going, oh. uh, which I think it's kind of what it's like. Um, I, I, I've loved Westerns all my life. My, my brother and I grew up on Westerns. Uh, Brent Spiner and I, uh, big Western guys. I mean, we, we grew up with, with the Westerns, I mean, at one point, uh, Warner Brothers had probably 10 Westerns on the air at the same time. Um, so that was how we grew up and I always liked Westerns. And, um, and then as I got older, um, I started really liking good Westerns. And uh, there were, there's, there's always, I mean, there's a number of Westerns that I really thought were, were great. So when I, talk to my manager and she said, Michael, you got to do something, you know, you should do something. And uh, I said, well, I have an idea for a Western. And she goes, oh my God, do it, do it, do it. So I sat down and I knew that it was, I was on the right track because when I sit down to write something, it just flowed. 
It just, there was not, a, there was some moments where you went, okay, I can't go that way because I've seen that 10 times before. So what else can I do? What else fits in this? And, um, and it just became a, a, a labor of love and turned out very well. And we think it has a, a place in movies. There's a, there's a place for it right now. And um, so far, the, the people that, have, uh, that we've talked about, we haven't, we haven't showed the script to too many people, but the people that I have talked to, and I explain what I'm doing, they're all very excited and they want to talk to me about it. So that's, that's very good. Mm. But it's, it's, a, it's not about, um, I mean, the storyline is that it's a guy who is doing his last job so he can retire to Italy with his, with his wife and son. That's what he wants to do. Mm. And it's almost like he's trying to get to Italy, you know, but there's always something that is, that is preventing him. Yeah. And uh, what, so what do you, what do you, what's the story? Why is this so important? Why is this story so close to you? And it had, and then, and it seems like it, it really came from your heart. And, and uh, I'd love to hear why well, you want to tell the story. A number of things. Uh, when you see, if you look at the, the business as, as we, as you know, we've seen the business, there are black films and there are white films, you know? And the black films have a certain feeling about them. And uh, the white films have a certain feeling about them. Mm. Um, the, if it's a black film, uh, they kind of hit you over the head with racism and, and, and these type of things, uh, inequality. And, uh, and the white films, uh, they are uh, basically the, the savior of this black guy is a white guy. And so you, you have that going on. Yeah. I mean, that happens and, to Asian people too. I mean, that's just, you know, like that oh, similar Asian, a lot of the Asian stories are very straightforward and direct about the message yeah you know and i don't i don't and and it takes a for me it it was like when i saw um crouching tiger uh, i don't know how other people felt about that and i'm sure that you know if we had a discussion you'd hear a lot of different things but i felt it was um it didn't hit you over the head with anything except this excitement about who these people are and the things they're going through and the love story where Michelle Yeoh finally gets a chance to be with a person that she loves and it's over and he's dead. And it's just a, a beautiful, a beautiful movie. And, um, and so that is, that is the kind of movie that I always wanted to do. I mean, there is racism in my movie, but you know, it doesn't hit you over the head. You know, I think there's probably two lines mm -hmm. in the movie that have anything to do with race, um, three lines, but that's it, you know, mm -hmm. out of 114, 115 pages. Right, um, it's part of who what the I character would... is. Yeah, and, but what I wanted to do is I wanted to write a, a wonderful movie that I wanted to see, that I could go, wow, this is good, this is good, this is good, keep going, keep going, keep going, and yeah. that people will enjoy, people, yeah, everybody, you know, yeah. and um, and I also like I said I, I loved, you know, the the directors that I love. I mean, the old time directors, the William Wyler and the. Howard Hawks and John Ford's, yes. Um, uh, there's a guy, I mean, John Sturges, you know, really, really good. Don Siegel, really good. Uh, mm. And then, you know, of course, Coppola and um, uh, who's the other 
good, good fellows. Scorsese, you know, mm -hmm. really excellent. But my favorite now is, is, is um, uh, Tarantino. Mm. Well, and the title is, is Quentin Hawks. Is there any sort of, um, sort of inspiration behind that? That the title, the name of your character, uh, the Western is Quentin Hawks and Quentin Tarantino. Yeah, yeah, um, <laughs> yes. I know that's a little obvious, but um, there, if you know, it's not, a, it's not obvious until you say it. But it, I mean, well, yeah. there is a lot of a lot of sort of, um, you know, the writing is, uh, uh, you know, to people out there, I've, I've I've read it, which is it's a great script, and and it's it's um, filled with. Excitement. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I and I don't and I don't want to copy Quentin. No, uh, but I do. But I, but I, his. It's really difficult to explain, but there's a certain feel mm -hmm. to a Tarantino movie, and that feel is very much um, tied to who he is. You know. What he mm -hmm. writes and what it is where it comes from him, mm -hmm. and they he's been very fortunate and people have given him the opportunity to do that, and he doesn't write like anybody else. That's because he writes for himself. Mm -hmm. and yeah, if, and you if, have if the so action, much if the action, I mean, if the action is going to stop and people are going to talk for like ten minutes, so be it because that's what I feel. Hmm. And so that's what, I, that's what I wanted to do with this. I want it to be everything that's on the page comes from inside me. What do I see when I see old Westerns? What do I see when I see new Westerns? I love uh, the grittiness of The Unforgiven. And Tarantino is sort of a sense of inspiration, but it's, it's really more your telling the story from what you enjoy and who you are and that's your own style and that's what you appreciate about him. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I didn't I realize that, that that's what you meant. Yeah. And the idea that, that, you know, we're not hitting people over the head with racism mm -hmm. is, is who I am. I, I just, if people ask me about it, I say, well, this is how I feel, but I don't, you know, walk out of my front door, you know, with a chip on my shoulder about, you know, what's going on. Mm -hmm. You know, it just kind of goes, whoa, this is, you know, so, um, so that's what it, that's what it came down to. And the other thing too, is that whenever I go down a road and it feels um, familiar to me, you know, in terms of direction of the script, if it feels familiar, I, I take a left turn and it's not a trick and it's not like, you know, oh, you know, it, it really leads you to another way to, to do this. And the way it leads you is actually much better than what you were planning on doing. Um, there was a, I sent you the latest script, but there was a, uh, my cousin, who's a dear, you know, he's like my brother, we're all very close. But I gave it to him and he says, well, Michael, who's going to play the lead? And I go, I'm going to do it. He goes, you're not 35. You know, you're not, you can't do it. I go, oh, yeah, I can. He goes, no, no, you can't, you know. And I go, well, what can I play, you know? And so he says, well, you can play this age. And I go, yeah, I can play that age, you know. I, that's not a stretch. And so instead of going, uh, well, I'm not going to do it or whether case, I said, let me just take a look at this. And that led me down a road that made the script much better because it added a layer mm -hmm. that wasn't there before. And um, it, it just opened him up, you know, just added more to him and added mm -hmm. more to the piece and added more to the urgency of him getting the hell out of there and, and going to Italy before it gets too late, you know? Yeah. So, so that's kind of what I allow myself to do. Some people write and they write 
and they are going to write it this way. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if bombs are going off or, you know, there's nuclear war. This is the way it's going to be written. And, yeah. you know, and that's what you get. You don't allow yourself to, to, um, to think in other respects. And I think that's, that's also a big part of what the script is. Mm. And yeah, I, mean, I could... like, I like, I like action and I like, you know, action that comes out of nowhere, you know? Yeah. And it, it's not people are going, well, that doesn't make any sense, but it's like, yeah, they're coming along and all of a sudden, no, oh my God, you know, there's people after them, you know? And so, and so all of that is, is in that, you know, and, and hopefully, I mean, I like to think, and I've read it a few times. I like to think that I, I didn't copy anybody. I don't want to do that. I just wrote what I liked. Hmm. Well, and, and, and then putting, you know, going down that path and making that decision that, you know, you know, that the character and its experiences and the, and the message are, are going the path of who you are. It, it almost becomes inevitable that you're the best person to not only play the role, but also direct it because you have a vision yeah. of what it's going to be. Yeah, definitely. definitely. And, and I got to tell you, when I got in this business um, from the very first day, I knew that because um, I, I was in music for a long time. And when you're in bands and, you know, big bands and small bands, you depend on five people or 10 people or four people to, for your success. And in those days, you know, people would show up without their instruments, you know, and you go, well, we have a gig. Well, I don't know where my drums are, you know, and you go. And so at that moment, I said, you know, if I'm going to screw up, you know, if I'm going to, I want to do it on my own terms. You know, I want it to be my screw up because then I could learn and I could do something different in whatever the case. But if, if I'm depending on everybody else to, then, then, you know, once again, and so this is the opportunity also to have it on my terms. Mm. So I don't go, well, you know, it would have been good, but the director didn't understand this, you know, I, you know, I don't want that, you know, or, well, you know, the actor really didn't do what, you know, what he, I, I just don't want that. I want this to be all of my screw up or all of my success. Hmm. I think that, so. yeah. And well, I, obviously I can totally, totally agree with that. I mean, taking on that responsibility, you are sort of accept everything. Um, oh, you it know, it's like a lot of you actors know. want that because, <laughs> you know, I think act, like actors in, in general want want to take that on because, well, especially, you know, someone like you who has so much experience and probably seen all the, a lot of mistakes that other people make along the way. Um, you know, that's, that's huge. That, that, um, and the, stuff, and the stuff they do good. The yeah. stuff that they, that they really pull off, you know, exactly. is really something, you know? Yeah. I mean, you wouldn't, I mean, you know, Tarantino's movies are just out there. I mean, they are, they are in another stratosphere because you know, they, they elicit, I don't think there's any middle ground with his audience, you know? Mm -hmm. They love it or they hate it, you know? <laughs> it's like, in fact, I was talking to my brother and he goes, we were, we were talking about Inglorious Bastards. Absolutely one of my favorite movies ever. And um, he goes, I didn't like it. I said, really, why not? Hitler didn't die that way. And I go, okay, well, that's, that, that's fine. <laughs> you know? And that's the thing, you know, is that yeah. that's what I loved about it. You know, that's mm -hmm. what I loved about it is that, no, of course not. I know that, but... Yeah what if, you know, or uh, once upon a time in America, in, in Hollywood, you know, yep. what if Charles Manson's followers went to the wrong house, but not only did they go to the wrong house, they went to the wrong house where a guy has a pit bull and is beating the crap out of everybody. And the other guy has a flamethrower. Flame <laughs> 
You know, and yeah. that to me is like, but I got to tell you something. When I when they mentioned the flamethrower before in the movie, I went, oh, we're going to see that flamethrower. <laughs> At some point, we're going to see that flamethrower again. I guarantee that. So, yeah. Love it. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I think this is a good play. Well, you know, I, I appreciate you doing this, um, this video cast podcast with me, uh, you know, and I, I love no uh, um, all that I've learned today um, from you and in the past. And I appreciate our friendship. So, um, no so hopefully we can do this again, but I, thank you again for uh, doing this no and, problem, and being a part of agent revelation. Uh, you know, it's been, it's been an honor and a privilege. So. Well, cool. Well, it's my pleasure, man. Good seeing you again. Yeah.